So I'm thinking about making this a series. It's obvious that every K-pop company on the planet is at best uninterested in their idols as people and at worst actively malicious, and netizen responses often range from helpful to worse than napalm. Today I'm going to be ranting about 7 K-pop groups that deserved better than what they got. The way SM has done ESPA has been so blatantly, brazenly cheap. ESPA have had a rough start compared to 4th gen contemporaries like ITZY and Seraphim and especially New Jeans. Yeah, they hit the ground running, but they've already got way more dents in their reputation than any three-year-old group should have, and it's because everything has felt like a marketing scheme since day one. First there was the Virtual World concept, which was absolutely not proven before Lee Suman decided to bleed it into every other SM act and annoy quite literally every fandom SM still controls. There was the plagiarism scandal, and Giselle's N-word scandal, of course, and then there was Got the Beat, which really just made every K-pop fan that might have given Espa a chance drop them in disgust. But what's been killing me these days is the appeal for Western success. I cannot stress this enough, HYBE's activities in 2023 have been absolutely embarrassing. Like the desperate push for American success has hit every single one of their groups, and all it's really amounted to is pointless money spending that goes nowhere, and SM's designs of late have convinced me that they want nothing more than to be HYBE. There is a reason why whenever anyone online is ready to drag ESPA, their defenders are quick to point out, oh, they're actually really popular in Korea. And you know what? They're right! ESPA's primary market, where all their millions of sales are, are in Korea. They do have a minor following in Japan with a very, very small fraction of the sales, and their American sales are even smaller. I can't stress this enough, they are nowhere near as successful in Japan or America as TWICE, and TWICE is not even the first name people think of when they think super notable Western success. And you know what? G-Idol can catch some of this too, because it was them that did this first in 2023 with the ballsy idea to have an all-English EP, which SM has now decided to ape for ESPA. Like, what exactly are you expecting here? Every ESPA fan and their mother is demanding the full album ASAP, and you're burning money on projects like this in some harebrained scheme you're convinced is going to make you the next New Jeans. This is embarrassing behavior, and ESPA really cannot afford it anymore. Here's some information for you to process. Card's YouTube channel has more subscribers than Super M. Or Nmix. Or ATs. Or Eyes One. Or Monsta X. Or GFriend. Or God7. Or Luna. Or Dreamcatcher. And way more than Rise. And yet, absolutely nobody talks about them. They sell like absolute trash with even acts like Cherry Bullet selling more. Yes, freaking Cherry Bullet is outselling Card. Let's face facts here, when Young Pussy debuted with a name that sounds like a Young Pussy and a debut song called Macaroni Cheese evoking the infamous Pussy that sounds like Mac and Cheese, a viral meme, even before the song itself was revealed to have wildly inappropriate lyrics and imagery, I completely lost my mind. Because this is the group that ESP would rather spend money on than properly promote Card. I love Card, but DSP treats them like a failed experiment. Ring the Alarm and his associated album actually broke 20k sales for a change, and in response, DSP threw them in a dungeon for 11 months, and then when it came time to promote them again, they scrounged up enough funds for a single set that had to serve an entire music video for Without You, and then made the entire Icky music video out of 2003 Mortal Kombat CGI. This, on top of having no backup dancers for a four-member group, and relying on the members to produce the songs, write the lyrics, and then make the choreographies half the time too. It's insane how much work these two girls and two guys are putting in, VM constantly on the timeline for Thirst Traps and Big Titty Gang merch, and doing all the legwork to promote, while doing a podcast on the side, just for their own well-funded company, DSP, to act like they're not worth a fucking budget. And I can't even pin this all on them, because Card's fandom act like they barely exist too. 3.6 million subscribers and tours that shake the house down, but absolutely no revenue coming in on albums. It's like that time somebody asked Todd Howard when he was going to stop re-releasing Skyrim, and he answered, when you stop buying it, and we all sat there furious knowing he was right. Same thing. When will Card stop being new goo? When you start buying the albums. I know the reality of K-pop corporate practice is that the numbers themselves actually don't make much off of album sales, and benefit more from those touring numbers and advertisements, but I can't stress this enough. If the company isn't making profits on albums, they will eventually shelve the group. That combined with the sheer disrespect K-pop fans saddle them with leaves me livid on a daily basis. Remember Young Posse? Their debut has been panned so far, and people that actually paid attention to it lamented that this nonsense came from the same company that produced such great acts as Kara, Lee Hyori, Sech Sky, however the hell you pronounce that, and April. Card completely unmentioned. Really? April? Fucking April? That's who pops into your brain when you think of DSP's list of latent great K-pop acts? The girls who bullied one of their members into a suicide attempt? The group who made absolutely no noise except for that one song that wasn't even that good? I'm sorry that you like all my mistake, but please, expand your fucking horizons. Jesus. If you have no idea who this group is, then that's fine. I don't expect you to. 
BBC were under Brand New Music, which was already spelling trouble. Brand New Music were one of the companies that sought to benefit from the success of 101, with 101's immense success hopefully bleeding over into the groups that formed from their ex-members. One such group is AB6. AB6's debut, Breathe, was liked and respected, and nothing they've done has moved anyone since. I can't stress this enough, AB6 are Nugu as hell, and they're still the most popular act Brand New Music has got. AB6 managed to successfully overshadow the other group Brand New Music formed in 2019, this time from boys who didn't make it into the group formed by Produce X101. They were a three-member act called BDC, and that's about the most people know of them. Again, I can't stress this enough, everything about BDC screams that their company considered them an afterthought, like everything about how they were marketed just screamed, we give half a shit. To be fair, it probably seemed like a better idea to have ex-produce boys promoting than not promoting, but juggling two groups at once was always a bad idea, even if you actually treat them both like they matter. First of all, three-member groups are a very difficult thing to get right in the first place. You can't compose them with the same members that you find in a six-member or nine-member group, and you can't market them in the same way. Before their disbandment, every single track BDC put out had the word Moon in it. Shoot the Moon, Moon Rider, Moonlight, Moonwalker, etc. These all came from a trilogy of albums referred to with the leading title, Intersection, which was a problem since BAE 173, another new group promoting at the time, also had a trilogy of releases with that title. Allegedly, the reason for the Moon theming was some kind of alternate world storyline, which tells me that at least someone on the marketing team had some vague ideas that they wanted to work with, but never managed to fully flesh out. I'm very certain that if you trace back far enough, you'd get to Odd Icicle in there somewhere. Now, although I wouldn't say their music was slaying the house down, I also wouldn't say BDC's music was bad. Their title tracks frequently had a somewhat retro feel with vague disco leanings, fitting in with their sci-fi concept. Moonwalker in particular tends to stick in the brain thanks to that sleek anti-talk chorus with the moonwalking choreo. They had potential, and brand new music really should have worked on nurturing that potential rather than debuting yet another boy group, which brought the count in 2022 to three active boy groups under one company, and sticking BDC in the dungeon. AB6, BDC, and Unite all had releases in 2022, although BDC was a ballad single that screamed disbandment songs. All through Renugu, but only BDC was given the chance to compete on peak time, the 2023 survival show JTVC brought that sought to give ratings boosts to a lot of K-pop acts that were freshly Nugu or languishing on shelves. Peak Time was legitimately a valuable chance for a lot of these groups, and there's a reason many people preferred watching it over Boys Planet, which overlapped with it. For reference, Vayner, that group that won the show, went from selling less than a thousand copies to selling over a hundred thousand. DKB, one of the top-ranking acts, got to go on the Peak Time tour and went from an average of eight thousand copies sold to over fifty thousand. It doesn't feel like BDC were given much of a shot on the show, not helped by their somewhat timid vibes. But it was clear that they wanted this bad and had the talent to go pretty far. They were consistently in the top slots, but not receiving the benefits from the later challenges caused them to get eked out in time for eliminations. And while tears were shed from every eliminated group, most competitors handled it well. BDC, on the other hand, were clearly devastated. A better company might have taken this second opportunity and given them a proper comeback, especially as making it as far as they did in the peak time competition not only came with a free song theirs to perform as they pleased, and actually kind of a good one at that, but if organized quickly enough could have seen them actually standing on the same ground as their brother group, AB6. Instead, they were given another ballad song to mark their official disbandment, and that's all she wrote. Activities between peak time and the song Rest were sparse, and even on camera, it seemed like the members knew their time was up. With their disbandment, BDC's company Brand New Music effectively wasted a second chance many K-pop companies and K-pop acts would have killed for. It is insane to me how used to Kepler's lack of success we as a community have gotten. There's about 5,000 videos on KTube already on how their potential as a group was wasted, but I still find points that need to be belabored going unmentioned, and I still find deniers that want to act like Kepler was always going to fail, and was destined to never compete with Lacerra from New Jeans. Like, come on. As much as we all hated the shit show that was Girls Planet 999, we have to admit to ourselves that the survival show Empire would go on. Kepler's early success was there, despite the abysmal debut track and album. The excitement and notoriety was there, despite the weird name. There were no scandals dragging them down. If it weren't for Mnet being the most boneheaded, brain-dead motherfuckers on the planet, Kepler would still be big at this very moment. Like, eyes one tear, I'm serious. Putting freshly debuted rookies on Queendom 2 was a move anyone could have told you was going to backfire. You can't stick rookies on survival shows that are essentially popularity contests, because even if the fandom they have is big, it won't be stable. You have to let the glue dry before you actually send them competing with other groups, and at this point in time, Kepler had exactly two and a half original songs to their name. They had no iconic hits people were waiting to see, and the most they could boast was a decent dance line that absolutely wouldn't carry them through a fight with the likes of Hyolin, Shinbi, and Luna. As much scorn and mockery as Mnet received for handing one of the coveted spots on Queen of Two to their very own group, who debuted ten minutes prior, it's important to know that they had done this before, just not on the same scale. TO1, another group on this list for entirely different reasons, were born when the survival show Empire was at full steam, and Mnet had dozens of smaller shows running at the same time as their produce titan. 
Then called TOO, they were freshly debuted rookies too when Mnet saddled them on Road to Kingdom, the preliminary fight to earn a spot on the actual Kingdom show. There was no way Mnet were going to hand TOO one of those coded Kingdom spots, especially when there was a whole competitive show just to earn one. It would never be achieved short of bald-faced riggery, and everyone knew it. But they also couldn't let TOO go home first, as it would be essentially admitting that yeah, their groups can't compete. So the question became less, when is TOO going home, and more, who's going to take the fall and be eliminated first so the TOO can skate by? And the answer was Golden Child. Apparently, this working out without too much mockery meant that Mnet felt that they could really do the same thing with Kepler in a serious competitive format and use Queendom 2 to boost their popularity further. Instead, it tanked, because Kepler's big but unsecure fanbase only really amounted to a bunch of extra second-choice votes for the other acts. Queendom 2 was embarrassing for Kepler every single week, with their performances being passed over at best and pissed on at worst. They arguably had less fans when they left than when they walked in. While Queendom 2 was especially damaging, it wasn't hopeless as long as Mnet didn't fuck it up again. Up was a surprising success, and despite the comeback bombs falling in summer of 2022, they actually earned a lot of praise for having the best summary song of that year. Naturally, they followed that up with We Fresh, a song in the same style as Wada Da, but arguably worse, and proved that Kepler's worst enemy was always going to be their own company. And while Mnet is certainly not blameless in this group's downfall, they probably have less to do with it than one catastrophically messy member, but one thing at a time. Like I said, TO1 started as TOO, and were dual managed between Mnet and NCH Entertainment. During their stint on Road to Kingdom, which was announced before the group had even debuted, and started airing less than a month after, the group caught some heat because member Chan was wearing dreads for a performance, although not a lot of heat because nobody watched that show. The first signs of Mnet being messy and kneecapping their own group came when Wake One essentially snatched the group away from NCH for no given reason that I can find, and opted to handle the group's promotions themselves, with NCH noticeably being confused and put off by this decision. They rebranded as TO1, and despite being firmly Nugu, they still had a chance. What warrants the first smack to the forehead was the removal of members, something you never want to go through because it almost always impacts sales and notoriety. First was Chihoon, one of the guys who had some skill in producing, leaving in early 2022. This happened while Woongi, the most popular member by far, was on hiatus for mental health, which made sense as he'd been the victim of some rather homophobic remarks online. And this was followed in June by the departures of three more members, Woongi, Jerome, and Minsu, and the amount of mess that contains is just despicable. For those who aren't aware, TO1 were, as previously stated, formed from a survival show. All of these members worked hard and won their spots in the group fair and square. What's more, Woongi was easily the only reason people knew of the group at all, because it was funny, sassy, a little fruity, and very popular with fans. He, along with Jerome and Minsu, had this unofficial subunit affectionately called Two Weiss, because they were very into girl group songs and liked performing them. Again with emphasis, fans loved these guys. Their leaving was announced as a mutual decision, but nobody's buying that because the company mentioned a quote-unquote change in direction and just happened to be saying goodbye to the three most feminine members. They kicked these dudes out due to raging homophobia, which is how I knew beforehand that Woongi being on Boy's Planet was not going to end with him in Zero Base One, despite his popularity and established talent. The members that were removed from TO1 were replaced by two new members, Daigo and Renta. And one of those has already left as of earlier in 2023, which should tell you something about how badly this group is run. What's especially insane to me is that not only did Woongi, Jerome, and Minsu pretty blatantly get kicked out for being too feminine, but the quote-unquote change in direction that was allegedly being signaled was not one that wouldn't have suited them. In fact, fun, upbeat songs like Drummond and Freeze Tag honestly would have suited Woongi and friends way better than the darker concepts they'd been doing before. So basically, Mnet are full of crap. They cut off their noses despite their faces, removing the most popular members of the group among fans because they didn't look straight enough. But all of that is only scratching the surface. Only a couple months after the removals of Chihun, Woongi, Jerome, and Minsu, and less than a month after their fresh comeback with new members Daigo and Renta, TO1 announced KCON LA. Remember that heat that I mentioned that the group had gotten due to member Chan wearing dreads on Road to Kingdom? Well, about now, Chan decided to be the biggest problem the group could have. At KCON LA 2022, TO1 covered Sai's recent release, That That, featuring Shuga. And on the line, Yanega, that starts Shuga's rap, Chan whipped off his cowboy hat to reveal... A drag. It's like that, A drag, if you're not aware, is a cloth worn by black people to protect their hair, dating back to colonial times. Despite similar fabrics and headwear popping up in other cultures sometimes, it is definitely a drag Chan was wearing and had been wearing, even off schedule, ever since debuting. 
If you're not black, wearing one is both racist and trashy. While K-pop as a whole is certainly no stranger to racism and cultural appropriation scandals, I can't think of a more insane one than this in recent memory. Chan specifically revealed the drag on the lyric he knew sounded very similar to the end slur in English. Yes, that really happened right there on stage in the middle of LA in front of all those black people. He really did that. Chan sat out of a few legs at their American activities following that performance, allegedly due to catching COVID-19, but most people aware suspect that it was dubbed the heat he was getting as black K-pop fans across the country who had seen the stage in LA were incredibly pissed and allegedly booing him at fan meets. Did Chan ever apologize for this? Surprisingly, yes, he did. A year later, like an entire year later, right when KCON 2023 was just weeks away and TO1, unsurprisingly, were not on the list of invites. Naturally, everyone pegged this as a pointless, defeated move taken only after it was proven that Chan's racism scandal had actually pissed people off that badly. The TO1 schedule has been quiet ever since, with no comebacks in the years since Freeze Tag in November of 22, and none in sight. But hey, at least in September of 2023, Chan put another mixtape out, which noticeably features the lyric, I'm gonna be the next generation Tory Lanez. Yes, Tory Lanez, the guy who shot Megan Thee Stallion and is most famous for shooting Megan Thee Stallion. There's even gunshot sounds in the instrumental backtrack, so there's no way he didn't know. Only a couple weeks after this, replacement member Renta left the group, and frankly, I don't blame him. While Chan is an incredibly racist person and a complete garbage fire of a human overall, some scrutiny should be cast on Mnet too. In many instances where K-pop fans wear things offensive to Westerners, it's usually blamed on the ignorance of stylists or photoshoot directors, but those people don't have input on stage performances. Chan noticeably does, with the k direct incident very much being pre-planned in advance, and Chan having described himself as taking part in directing stage performances before. But he also would have had to run that past Mnet at some point, because it's astronomically unlikely Wake One would have allowed an idol to make alterations to a stage performance at KCON of all places without their prior approval. Not only that, but Emmett's silence since the various incidences has spoken volumes. Despite the group starting out in Nugu, Emnet kicked out at least three members for not being masculine enough and in the process damaged their own brand as upset fans left, but they refused to kick out Chan despite the man's history of tanking his own group's reputation. Chan does contribute to composing some of the group's tracks, but after a certain point, that stops being enough to justify keeping him. I can only imagine that Chan's racism is condoned by his betters at Mnet, or at the very least, they don't care and would rather the group suffer than remove him. BAE are mostly famous because one of their members is Lee Hong Yul, one of the more popular boys from Produce X101 who made it into the short lived group X1. And that's about all they're famous for, likely because people having to constantly ask what the hell BAE173 means has proven to be a setback to gaining new fans. It's safe to say that X Produce Boys have not had nearly the same success as X Eyes One Idols. But while BAE173 were settled with a very weird name that someone should have immediately vetoed, their music was pretty good early on. They got a lot of attention for their debut track, Crush On You, to the extent it's still associated with them enough that it was played for their grand reveal on peak time. Crush On You was a bright, upbeat boy group sound and ahead of the trend for that reason standing out in a sea of boy groups all trying to be the most aggressive, underfed badasses the K-pop has ever seen. Their follow-up to this track, Loved You, was not as well received, but still sits within the same style of music that was giving them respect, kind of like Numb for Six following Movie Star. Where things started to go wrong was their second comeback, Jaws, which is a rare miss from Ryan Jun if you ask me, because whereas Crush on You and Loved You stood out from the crowd, Jaws is pretty much the definition of basic bad boy K-pop, not at all standing out. I still can't remember what it sounds like, I only know that I don't really want to. Where still, after Jaws, came Dash, which very much fits that same standard, but was produced by Dohyeon instead. Look, I'm not trying to be a shithead, but the fact is that being self-produced really only works if you're good at producing. I wouldn't have expected 16-year-old Dohyeon to be any good at it, certainly not enough to launch a title track for the whole group. But these things mean little to a K-pop company that's interested in a double whammy of money saved by not having to pay production fees, and encouraging accolades for authenticity among K-pop fans. Fact of the matter is, Dash kind of sucked, as did Get Him Ugh. BAE173 did not have comebacks for a while after this, and as of now, still haven't had one, which is a huge problem. What probably didn't help was Dohyun himself. Fast forward a bit past the peak time part of the story, and it's revealed he sued for contract suspension, and won, explaining why the group went on peak time without him. Peak time, as we already know from the story about BDC, was an incredibly valuable opportunity. 
But while I've already told you that peak time overlapped with the boys' planet and was preferred by some people, what I didn't tell you was that there was, in fact, a third boy-centric survival show being hosted at the same time, called Fantasy Boys. If that name sounds like a huge red flag, there's a second one incoming. One of the companies involved was Pocket Doll, BAE-173's company, who will be managing the group formed from it. And the third red flag is the presence of a literal 13-year-old in said group once the show is over. 2009 liner, I'm serious. If you want to know how it's going, the Fantasy Boys group didn't even manage to debut before the leader, center, and number one ranked guy left the group, airing out truly staggering contract details. Pocket Doll tried to smear him and his mother, who was acting as his agent given Yu Jun Won wasn't signed to a company when he competed, and painted her as being overbearing. But frankly, I think her complaints about exposing outfits was valid given everything we've already covered, and Jun Won only being freshly 20 years old at that point. Then Jun Won posted his contract and revealed that Pocket Doll had saddled the members with extraordinary charges that the company should in any sensible world be paying for, including paying managers, in a series of price tags that totaled astronomical amounts, with an ever so gracious clause that these charges could be waived, if Fantasy Boys managed to sell more than 500,000 albums, a number well out of the reach of any K-pop group not from the Big Four, and certainly more than could ever be achieved by this group. So, with downright dastardly management like that, it's little wonder Do Hyung quietly sued his way free of the company. It's just a shame that the other eight members decided to stick it out, and chose to compete on peak time, marking fellow X1 member hong as competing on his third survival show. Like I said, peak time was actually really beneficial for the groups involved, but as with BDC under brand new company, BAE-173's high ranking on the show, even going with a peak time tour due to performing so well, is being wasted, with no comebacks in sight because like brand new, Pocket Doll would rather play with their shiny new board group than waste any more time on an older one. Basically, if I were Hangul, I'd have just burned down the building at this point. The 50-50 situation was easily the most iconic mess of 2023. A group shot from Nugudum to Superstardom on the back of a viral song, just like Brave Girls and Momoland before them. I'm not recapping that entire situation because this video is long enough as it is. What I do want to say is that this is basically the definition of K-pop groups that deserved better, both from companies and the K-pop public at large. It was frankly astounding the way that case has played out over the months, because I had thought that after the pileup of late 2022 cases involving Luna, Omega X, and Lee Soon Gi, would have taught us that the one thing sure is that you can never trust a CEO. And already I hear the same chorus that's been affecting the 50-50 story ever since. Oh, but this is different from Luna, different from Chu. But is it? Is it really? Is it actually different, or is it just messier? Because I can't help but think that this whole fiasco has been one long scenario of watching K-pop fans immediately side with the devil as soon as things get remotely hard. The journalism on the 50 case was relentless and ruthless, with multiple K-pop news sites taking every opportunity, sometimes multiple times a day, to report on anything that damaged the girls' cases and lifted up a track CEO John Hong Joon. I was going to do a thing here where I scrolled you through the literal hundreds of screen caps taken just from early July's all K-pop articles, so you could see just how fast articles about 50-50 were being shot out like bullets, and how quickly the narrative was bent against them, and how utterly depraved the things people were saying about them were. Alas, it was too much for my editing program, and literally crashed it. So we'll have to pursue that another day. While noticeably skating by any holes easily poked in said CEO's case. Frankly, I think the thing that ultimately killed the girl's reputation was simply staying silent. The amount of shit they put up with from that company during their time promoting was quite honestly insane and dangerous, but as many people have pointed out, they stayed silent for the early parts of the case. What's especially a shame is that, in another case, this might have worked. I imagine many lawyers tell their clients, shut the fuck up, because anything you say will be remembered and weaponized. But in the end, silence only allowed John Hong Joon to dominate the media field, and he happened to be marginally better at it than Blockberry, spinning tales about selling Rolexes and cars, and letting the world know how wronged he'd been, and how uninvolved in 5050's lives he was, just in case they exposed any of the mistreatment they'd been through. Frankly, considering how messy JHJ was about the whole thing, dragging Warner Music Korea publicly when their part in the scandal has amounted to basically no involvement whatsoever, I'd hazard to say that he probably got lucky with Xion turning out to be a criminal. But what's crystal clear to me is that while Xion may have been the ultimate target in his PR bombing runs, the girls of 50-50 themselves were not spared, and intentionally so. The narrative that emerged early on that the girls were manipulated by Xion into suing, and then that the girls themselves were backstabbing greedy harpies that wanted to destroy JHJ and steal all his money, undoubtedly benefited JHJ. I'm sure he thought that their reputations being dragged through the mud for months on end would force them to drop the lawsuit, only for them to stick to their guns. The way netizens have behaved about all this is disgusting, and I do mean that. 
the abhorrent things that were said about these girls really warrants nothing less than being bullied off the face of the internet, if you ask me. And when a 50-50 finally broke their silence about the shit they'd been put through, it was downright shameful the way people pivoted into, Well, that's not really abuse. Or, They're lying about fainting. And, Yeah, well, that sort of treatment is standard in K-pop. As if that would make it better even if it was true. And what's not any better than this behavior is the Doom posting. Oh, well, they destroyed their own careers. No, they didn't, you jackass. Manipulative and abusive companies destroyed their careers. When you say non-committal shit like this, you make it very clear you basically never cared from the beginning, which is a pattern I've noticed whenever an idol someone doesn't like falls to ruin. You're not any better than the leeches on all K-pop just because you want to pretend like you have an objective view of things, when really all you're being is an asshole. What I'm curious about is how many times we have to learn this lesson before we stop trusting K-pop companies and stand with the idols. How many more idols have to be abused or, God forbid, take their own lives before we stop giving them shit for outdoing Blackpink at something? 50-50 deserved better. They still do.